and welcome to Rouge Radio, the CIS podcast on rougeradio.com. I'm Kevin Garbuio, and joined today with Jim Mullen from Crown Canadian University Countdown. Thank you very much, Jim, for joining us. Thanks very much, Kevin. And we were just talking briefly earlier about what's going on in the West, and we'll just get it started right now with the game you covered on Shaw TV. Regina defeating Saskatchewan 35-26. Take us into that game. That was a fabulous one just by checking the Brock score. Unable to see it coast to coast, but you were there and giving it to us. Yeah, it was a, a fantastic event, actually. Uh, the folks in uh, Saskatoon, mainly led by uh, an alumnus, David Dubé, uh, uh, made uh, a big investment into the uh, program there. And a matter of fact, uh, I think maybe one of the reasons I bring it up is that our sponsor for uh, uh, Canadian Countdown is Crown Produce. <laughs> it's owned by David Dubé. Uh, so he's made a big, big investment in Saskatoon and into CIS football. Uh, as a result, uh, there was an unofficial Canada West record crowd there uh, for this uh, Saskatchewan Cup final, uh, which was 9,033. Uh, was the official crowd count. Now, that's significant because there's only 6,100 seats in the building. Uh, as for the game, um, it was going back and forth. There was a good rhythm in the first half until uh, redshirt freshman quarterback Drew Burko pulled out of the game uh, uh, late in the second quarter uh, with some problems with his no- non-throwing hand. Uh, in came Chase Bradshaw. Uh, he's got five years on the clock, uh, played uh, four years with the Saskatoon Hillcocks and won two national championships. He didn't necessarily uh, get into the rhythm that he uh, liked to in the uh, in the second and third. As a result, uh, the Saskatchewan offense started to stall, and that's when you could cue uh, Mark Mueller and the um, Regina Rams offense that uh, really picked things up. Uh, Mueller was uh, sacked uh, five times on the day. I was a little surprised that Saskatchewan didn't maintain their pressure uh, on the uh, on the Regina offense. Uh, but uh, uh, Mueller was cool under pressure. Uh, you could tell the Rams were responding well to playing in front of a big audience and was energized for a, a provincial rivalry. And uh, at the end of the day, I think the Regina Rams made the claim that they are the number two team in the Canada West, and I, I think this was this game was pivotal uh, because even though Kit Hillis uh, followed up his 14-catch, uh, three-touchdown performance with another three-touchdown performance uh, for the Saskatchewan Huskies as a receiver, uh, I, I think that uh, Mueller made the claim uh, for the, being the Heck Creighton Award nominee uh, coming out of Western Canada. Yeah, we've still got a bit of a season to go yet, but uh, right now, he is rising above the pack as the top individual performer on the offensive side of the ball. Well, he seems to be doing a great uh, job after last year not being able to play because of the injury. And with that great crowd there, do you think Regina will be able, or Saskatchewan rather, will be able to host a Vanier Cup, seeing as next year it's in flux, it's already been announced in Toronto this year. Next year we don't know where it'd be. Do you think that Saskatchewan has a legitimate shot of getting it? Well, MRX is a company that uh, basically owns the Hamilton Tiger Cats, uh, to put a fine point on it. Uh, they uh, have generally the, the ownership to run the Vanier Cup. Uh, they did so in Vancouver uh, in conjunction with the Grey Cup. They're doing it with Toronto, and then they have three option years uh, after that to, uh, to manage the Vanier Cup. Uh, I, it still wouldn't surprise me if next year it ends up in, in London, Ontario, connected to some sort of stadium deal uh, where the Thai Cats can play while Iverwind Stadium is uh, being rebuilt. And I think London would be a great landing point uh, for the Vanier Cup. After that, uh, Laval has shown some interest. Obviously, they, they've put together some fairly successful Vanier Cups. It gets intriguing in that uh, Montreal and the Montreal Alouettes have shown great interest in hosting a Vanier Cup. Um, that that uh, that could uh, be played either at Olympic Stadium or uh, or Molson Stadium at uh, McGill. Uh, and I know that uh, David Dubay and company in Saskatoon are showing interest. Uh, you know, there may even be uh, some sort of interest in getting involved with an exhibition game for the Thai Cats in Saskatoon to uh, uh, maybe stoke things up uh, 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 next year. So. I think when you look at the, at the cities right now that are that are seriously looking at the Vanier Cup over the next three years, you've got Montreal, you've got Quebec City, you've got London, Ontario, 
and you've got Saskatoon in the mix. The thing that is uh, unpredictable about Saskatoon, of course, is the weather. And uh, you talk to a lot of people around that town, and they say, oh, man, we were lucky that the Huskies were in that game uh, a couple of years back against Lavelle because it was minus 25 or minus 30 at uh, kickoff. And if the Huskies weren't in it, even though they had sold tickets, there would have been a lot of people that didn't show up. So the the thing that you can't control in that mix uh, is the weather. I, I know that there's uh, there's hopes for uh, perhaps having a 12,000 seat permanent stadium uh, in Saskatoon. This may help them get towards that goal. Well, that'd be exciting, especially that year when the Huskies took on Laval. It was a great crowd, and that's usually an issue that happens across the board. What would happen if? Say Montreal had the had the Vanier Cup without being piggybacked by the Grey Cup. Would there be great attendance for that game if, say, the Caravan or even no team from the the Q was involved in it? Would that affect uh, attendance? Do you think? Well, that's the risk you take is um, uh, putting the risk up of not having a a uh, supposed home conference team. Uh, in your Vanier Cup. Now, I know as director of the Vanier Cup in Vancouver uh, last year, uh, working on behalf of uh, MRX, um, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for this game uh, early on. I I know when we walked in, uh, ticket sales were in around the 3,000 range uh, with about eight months to go, and we were looking at a disaster. But uh, uh, we we looked at every available way that uh, that we could get uh, tickets into the hands of folks. Uh, we were in a position where we couldn't give tickets away uh, because uh, Ticketmaster controlled the uh, the ticket base. So you know, if we wanted to give freebies away, it was only three percent. We had to sell these things, and we had to sell them in a hurry. So uh, we managed to do that. We managed to sell twenty four nine. Uh, I think uh, I know. Uh, I saw the manifest. We had 22,050 go through the turnstiles, um, and it was for a game with a team from Ontario and a team from Quebec playing in the final in Vancouver. So uh, I think if you're if you're well organized enough and, and, you, and you reach out to the right people and the right individuals, uh, you can get people in your building if you don't necessarily have a home conference team there. Uh, but it is a challenge if if you don't have that home flavor there. Oh, it's very true. Uh, continuing with the West going on forward, especially just talking about with no hometown team last year in Vancouver, UBC losing this week to Calgary, only putting up seven points, losing 62-7. to seven. Billy Green held to under 100 yards passing. What's going on with UBC right now? Just touch on that briefly as we know Calgary is a bit of a juggernaut right now in the West. Well, on one side, uh, Billy Green came into the season with some injuries. Uh, when the Thunderbirds learned that Billy Pavlopoulos, uh, their punter, uh, maybe the most outstanding punter in, in the Canada West, uh, wasn't coming back, uh, they tried Billy Green out in, in the spring and the summer as a punter. That ended up doing some damage to, to Green's knee. Uh, and that, in addition to uh, Billy Green having some arch problems, uh, uh, with his left foot, uh, left him in a position where he's been playing with injuries throughout the course of the year. Uh, but uh, I, I would think that uh, the, the Thunderbirds probably backed off when it looked like the uh, Dinos were running away with the game late in the uh, late in the first quarter. The big problem with UBC is <laughs> they haven't got anyone on defense. Uh, their defense is, is very very young. You take a look at the secondary. It's mostly uh, first and second year players. They uh, they thought that uh, that uh, Babalos was coming back at safety. He decided to pack it in after another shoulder injury at spring camp. They thought that Adam Konar, uh, son of Kevin Konar, had he had an outstanding um, uh, freshman year, uh, was coming back. Uh, he had uh, problems with his grades at UBC. He's spending this year playing uh, junior football. So there goes your guy that you had playing in the middle. And uh, Sean Olson, the head coach, ended up uh, finding a job for Serge Kaminsky, uh, the very, very capable defensive lineman who was going into his fifth year um, that plays the nose or plays the end. He's a big playmaker there, uh, and and, uh, Kaminsky uh, committed to the job. So full marks for Olson for helping the kid move to uh, the next level of his life. But, you know, you're taking out uh, your, your key uh, defense.
defensive lineman, your middle linebacker, and your safety slash half. If you got to be strong up the middle on defense with veteran talent, that's something that UBC doesn't have right now, and uh, uh, that's why the uh, the defense is so porous. Uh, uh, I don't think the issues are, are necessarily on the offensive side, but uh, the defense is uh, one of the worst I've seen since SFU's uh, defense back in uh, 2005 out here. As for the Calgary Dinos, I think that score speaks for itself. They are the class of the Canada West. Uh, I think they deserve to be uh, selected as uh, number two in the uh, FRC CIS top ten. Um, and you know what? They did it without a, a number of starters in their lineup. I think it's a, a testament to uh, the depth that uh, Blake Nill has put together and the power of his recruiting. Blake Nill is a great recruiter. And from all across the country, when you talk about Calgary, every position's too deep. They're too deep at every spot on the depth chart to- and their ones, twos could probably start on most teams across the country, and it shows how great of a recruiter Blake Neal is. Now going to Manitoba, defeating Alberta 51-38. Alberta putting up 38 points, which is pretty impressive for this team as they're young and they're still up and coming. And you've mentioned a few times on your Twitter feed that Alberta does have some tools on, on both sides of the ball. Is this go, looking good for their coaching staff moving forward? As you uh, mentioned before, they're going through a, a recruiting process right now for a head coach. Yeah, well, you know, the, the issues at Alberta um, – uh, have run pretty deep over the last few years. Uh, and and coming into the middle of that was the former offensive coordinator at uh, Manitoba, Jeff Stead, who's now the head coach there. The problem with, uh, with Stead right now is he's got that interim term in front of head coach as he's, as he's in his uh, second year. The University of Alberta has been conducting a search for a new head coach, and uh, they just – uh, closed off the process uh, this last week. So uh, Stead's been in Edmonton coaching with the sword of Damocles hanging over his head. Uh, and you know what? Uh, after a very uh, uh, underwhelming start against the uh, University of Calgary and uh, the uh, Alberta Golden Bears have been fairly solid in their last two games. Uh, they, they, uh, they put a scare into the Regina Rams. That game was 10-10 going into the fourth quarter. Uh, they made a couple of key goal line stands against the Rams. And then this game against Manitoba, they were only down by a touchdown with about four minutes left. Uh, Curtis Dell, he's a decent quarterback. And I think out of uh, all the quarterbacks that went to the CFL camps um, for uh, professional development, he may be the guy that benefited the most from it. His game is, uh, has really picked up, and that's significant because – uh, their uh, fifth-year running back that was supposed to be back, who was the center of the offense last year, K.K. Sanuga, uh, has uh, gone off to London, England to study law. So there was a fifth-year guy that they thought was coming back that didn't come back. And uh, they lost their top receiver, Porter Brown. And then in the game against Regina, they lost uh, maybe the top player on the team, uh, defensive player Tyler Greenslade, uh, for the for a se- uh, the entire season with uh, with an injury. So... Um, you know, when it rains, it pours in Alberta. But you know what? These guys keep responding. And in the past, uh, UBC going into Alberta has had all sorts of problems, no matter how strong their program has been. Uh, I think Alberta's got an opportunity to get their first legitimate win when UBC rolls into town. That should be an interesting game. No, oh, it should be exciting, especially with that bringing up first wins. This weekend in the OUA, Waterloo defeating York 23-22. Waterloo haven't been unable to win any game since that suspension during the steroid scandal a few years back. Waterloo, what does it say about their program and the steps they're making to go back to being a relevant team in the CIS? I think it says a lot about the commitment the coaching staff made throughout the uh, the, the course of that one year off and 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 sticking to uh, rebuilding a program. I, I think it says actually a lot about some of the support on campus too. Uh, you know, checking out that uh, first Waterloo game against uh, McMaster, I was shocked to see five thousand people there, um, and, and to see you know the students piled up on the hill and to see that level of support. That energizes a team. Sometimes that helps them get over the hump in those close games. Uh, I, I know there was a, a bit of a bleed of talent uh, out of Waterloo with those kids who didn't stick uh, uh, with the program. You know, when you lose a guy like uh, a rookie of the year like uh, Jordan Verdoni, um, 
uh, to the Calgary Dinos uh, on one of those instant transfers that was offered up. That that really takes the, the guts out of your defense. Um, but you know what? Uh, full marks to Waterloo. Uh, uh, you know it was uh, it was difficult to to watch that situation from afar to see them shut down the program like that for for a year. But uh, uh, you know if, if there was a comeback team of, of the year award uh, to to go to anyone, I think the Waterloo Warriors would be at the top of my list. Well, it's exciting to see the the steps that they made over the last few years. And then the big game this week in the OUA was Queens and McMaster. McMaster winning 33-20 and Queens giving up their first rushing touchdown of the year. Say something about this game. McMaster, the number one team going going into this week's uh, top ten polls. Not only their first rushing touchdown of the year that they gave up, the first rushing touchdown Queens has surrendered in 13 straight games. Uh, that, that was quite the stretch. Uh, Queens uh, is is a young team still in a lot of spots, and uh, and uh, they are developing. Uh, I was impressed with their uh, with their gutsy win over Western last week. Uh, but you know what? If there is a, a definitive number one in this country right now, it's the McMaster Marauders. And and just as uh, the Dinos made a statement uh, in in Vancouver with that overwhelming victory, I, I think uh, McMaster breaking a tie and owning first place all to themselves now uh, with uh, with a win that uh, has an exclamation mark at the end of it uh, like this uh, really says that they are the team to beat right now. Uh, you know, I think the sad thing is, out of all this, uh, if you're trying to project into the future, when you look at the bowl games, it is possible that the the, the real national championship will be the bowl game between the OUA and the Canada West champion. I mean, this is a collision course going on right now as we build towards this. Not to say that Regina can't knock off Calgary in a playoff game. Not to say that that Western or Queens couldn't get their act together uh, on a a nasty day in Ontario and uh, knock off McMaster. I mean, anything's within the realm of possibility. But it seems like we're on a collision course between Calgary and McMaster in the bowl game, and uh, and that's something that I'm already building some anticipation for. Oh, well, it's going to be exciting, especially if those two teams meet up, and with Kyle Quinlan going up against the Calgary defense, that'd be a very exciting matchup. Quinlan, just to touch on that, is Kyle Quinlan right now the lock for the Heck Raiden uh, Award? Or do you see anyone unseating that? I, I don't. I don't see anyone. Uh, um, surpassing Kyle Quinlan for the uh, Heck Creighton Award. And a matter of fact, if uh, Quinlan uh, didn't get into that altercation and was forced to sit out three games last year, I think he, we would be talking about Kyle Quinlan repeating for the Heck Creighton Award. I think the OUA put out a statement when uh, they sent Kyle Quinlan to represent the OUA as the Outstanding Male Athlete of the Year at the BLG Awards. Uh, so, and that's not taking anything away from Billy Green, who just had a fantastic year last year, uh, leading the UBC Thunderbirds. But uh, uh, I think, without question, right now, Kyle Quinlan is uh, is the best quarterback we've seen in uh, CIS football since Brad Sinopoli. And uh, it, it would be an absolute shame if uh, if he's not a game changer, if he's not a catalyst for the CFL to seriously start looking at accommodating Canadian quarterbacks in their rosters. It'll be really exciting with that, especially with the Montreal Alouettes owning uh, Quinlan's rights and him doing pretty good uh, last year at at the training camp, getting a few reps, getting some time in that, and showing more about how the CFL is developing some Canadian talent at that position. Other scores going across... Guelph defeating uh, Toronto 31-29. That game was on the score for University Rush. That was an exciting game and a really nice uh, way for Guelph to show a national audience their great facilities, especially their uniforms, their fields, and everything uh, with that matter. Yeah, what a great showcase for Stu Lang, uh, the coach, and uh, really the principal alumni investor in that uh, Guelph program. Uh, you know, uh, Lang made a commitment similar to David Dubay that I was mentioning before in terms of improving the fan experience uh, and and making sure that uh, that fans that show up at uh, University Stadium there are treated like uh, customers. 
Um, they've refurbished the uh, main grandstand, put the new field turf in, put the checkerboard in the end zones, uh, have the uh, uniform combinations by uh, by Russell. I believe they're wearing Russell. Uh, that gives them about three or four hundred different uh, combinations, which are always attractive uh, to recruits. Uh, I think they're doing the right things at Guelph. I think they're doing the right things with facilities. I know there's a indoor uh, off-season training facility coming in uh, uh, online there. And I think in a community like Guelph, there is really no reason uh, for, for, for a football program in the fall to not be the front and center event in, in, in a community uh, that size. I think they, they, ha- they are uh, really constructing the formula for success there. And I'm really excited to see where this program can be in three, four, and five years, because I think that that's the cycle that you have to look at uh, when when you're not only just building a, a team on the field, but when you're building a team off the field as well. Well, talking about teams on the upswing, like Guelph, let's talk about a team that's going on a downslope. Uh, Laurier defeating Ottawa. Ottawa just in shambles right now, and, uh, losing their head coach in the off season. And now, as we mentioned before, what kind of top-flight offensive recruit wants to play in a wing T offense? Yeah, uh, you know, I think when we show highlights of the Ottawa GGs uh, offense on uh, Crown Canadian Countdown, I think this week what we'll do is we'll show them in black and white, and the sound underneath will be a player piano because that's how out of date this offense is. I understand the Gary Echeverry, the, the head coach there, um, has a concept that if defensive players are smaller and lighter and faster to cover more territory, that you want to uh, face them with strength and blunt force. But this this double wing offense, you know, my goodness, um, it, it's it has produced some yards, it has produced some points, but it will not produce recruits. Their leading quarterback recruit. I uh, had a had a talk with uh, with Echeverry in the off season. Decided to return to Manitoba. First thing he did when he uh, when he got back to Winnipeg was get on the phone to Brian Doby with the Manitoba Bisons. Uh, if you're only throwing 14, 16 times a game, kids aren't going to be drawn to a program like that. I'm sorry. And on the defensive side of the ball, and this is Echeverry's forte, and this is his strength. Um, they've decided to go with a CFL type of defense. I can tell you that in, in my um, in my travels in the Canada West, you get to go to a lot of CFL games as well. Uh, the last year that uh, that Etch was uh, coaching at uh, in Saskatchewan, uh, I was at a Eskimos uh, Riders game. We went down after the game. We could hear the defensive players in full revolt, screaming out of the uh, Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Uh, uh, dressing room after the game, and their main complaints were that that there was no playbook for defense, that they let the defensive front just kind of make things up uh, as, as, as they went along, that there was no direction from the defensive coach. Now, full credit to, to Echeverry for trying to treat pros like pros and let them make their own decisions, but you've got to have a structure there, and that was his undoing. In, uh, in in Saskatchewan as as the uh, as the defensive uh, coach there and uh, and what it seems that he's trying to do to compensate on the offensive side of the ball in Ottawa is to impose too much structure with this uh, with this antiquated pop Warner offense that he has uh, you know I really like Gary Echeverry I know how dedicated he is but uh, man if you want to go through a process. Uh, turning off alumni and, and future recruits, he's doing the job right now. And when you've got a uh, potential monster like the well-funded Carlton program uh, across the street, uh, uh, basically raiding your uh, program for uh, for uh, for some uh, coaches, and then eventually raiding for um, for uh, for recruits, I think I know where Pedro the Panda is going to be next year, and it's not going to be sitting in garnet and gray. <laughs> oh, the Panda Bowl will be back next year. That's going to be exciting, but I don't I don't see what Ottawa is doing as being great for building up a team, especially even if players want to go to the CFL, what CFL scout is going to be looking at this team saying, 
well, this is a good look as what I do on offense or what we do on offense. What our receivers are I get the receivers have to be able to block, but in that situation, how many teams line up like that? That'd be only in the goal line. If if then, that'd be a more evolved more version of the wing tee in that level of the CFL. And I don't see how what Ottawa is doing is being great for building a franchise. Well, on the on the offensive side of the ball, I think the the, the positions that that may translate to the next level are on the offensive line, uh, maybe as a, a, a H-back or a fullback uh, with, with, the, with the type of power that they're, that they're trying to uh, uh, portray through that offense. Those might be the, the positions that you go up. But the, in terms of actual skill, you're not developing skill in these players running that type of O. Yeah, especially in players who do have aspirations of going to the next level, and they might – you can start making some decisions as I, if I want to play the next level, this isn't the place for me to go. And now we'll move out into the Quebec conference. We'll just touch on the Laval game because this is a great storyline as you brought up earlier uh, when we were talking beforehand. Laval wins 69 nothing against Miguel. No big deal there because Laval's starting to steamroll. They got the new offense coordinator and their offense is starting to get rolling as we saw last week against Acadia. But now Miguel, what they they've exhausted everything they can to try and compete in this conference and they applied to go to the OUA. You were saying this could be the 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 straw that broke the camel's back. Well, it could be a catalyst for for McGill to uh seriously examine a jump to the OUA. I mean, a lot of their uh traditional rivals exist in the OUA. I I can think that uh for instance bringing Queens into uh into uh, Molson Stadium would be a good draw for 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 uh, people at McGill, um, with around three million dollars in additional funding coming in. Uh, the folks at McGill have to ask the question: Can they still compete or keep up with uh, the francophone schools? Because th- th- that's what it comes down to. Now, that, that's not saying that trying to compete with Western McMaster. And Queens is going to be any easier in the OUA, uh, but right now within the regular season, that gap was just fully on display in in that absolute blowout uh, at at McGill. Um, you know, the other thing is is in terms of facilities. Right now, what uh, what Laval has uh, has developed in terms of their stadium and their off season training facilities is really Division One FCS level uh, when, when it comes right down to it. So even though um, you take a look at McGill and they, they've scraped together $3.5 million, which is no small feat, you look at Laval up the road and you're talking in terms of new investment and in facilities and all that, $7 million. So um, it, it, it would make sense, I think, for McGill to, to seriously consider that OUA option uh, their traditional rivals are there. It's something that could uh, uh, re-energize them. Uh, they would offer something different in the marketplace to what Montreal and Concordia uh, are offering. And what it might do, I think, is it may force the RSEQ to look more seriously at some level of amalgamation with the AUS. Because uh, I think right now the way the AUS is limping along with four teams um, that, uh, quite frankly, on the national level are underachieving and are, are never a threat in a bowl game, uh, they may be better off putting their lot in, uh, with, with Quebec and seeing how that goes in the long term. Well, especially since um, McGill's been trying so hard to rebuild and get back to their levels of where they were in the past, and it's um, possible right now to try and compete with Laval without the funding. Montreal's doing a great job of it, and this might be the changing of the guard this year, but McGill is so far off, I think, them going to the OUA, I agree with you, that would be a great move for them and a chance to start rebuilding and start building in talent and trying to lure some Ontario talent to in their programs. And now we move out east where if we're going to talk about uh, right now struggling, the, the AUS right now is just not too many teams are really stepping up to that next level. Acadia is almost there, but take us through it with Mount Allison. You were telling me earlier about how Mount Allison overcoming some hardships this week to get that first W. 
Yeah, Jake Hutch gets uh, their quarterback uh, injured after the first game. He's a Saskatchewan native, has uh, decided to pull the plug and uh, go back to Saskatchewan. Now, uh, there, there's there's an upshot of this in that uh, on two levels is one way to go Mount A for uh, for uh, responding to that and coming up with a big win. Um, uh, uh, that uh, that's a great statement, especially with some of AJ Walling's comments on his blog talking about how uh, Mount Allison should should pack it in when it comes to football and give it up. Uh, instead of giving it up, uh, you know, let's take a look at uh, different ways and different models to stay competitive uh, for for the Mounties and and keep the uh, student experience uh, uh, going there for football. Um, you know, the other thing with Hotchkiss, the, the second thing here, the other shoe to drop is I've got to believe that going back to Saskatchewan, I, I, I would bet my wife on it at this point that this kid's going to end up in Regina. Uh, Mark Mueller is playing out his fifth and final year. Uh, the uh, Regina Rams right now at uh, backup quarterback have Zach Olenek, who was playing slot back until uh, midseason last year, until uh, until Mueller went down, and it was obvious that the other backups that they had in place weren't up to the task. Um uh, Regina is going to go through a rebuilding process with 20 fifth-year players on their roster. Um, so what better way to bridge things than having a native son come home uh, who would probably be in his fourth year if he has a compassionate appeal after uh, getting injured in his first game to uh, instantly uh, jump into things at the University of Regina. Um, you know, uh, there's the other thought here too. There, there's lots of talk about the Canada West taking a step back because of the five and seven rule, uh, the rule limiting uh, uh, junior uh, participation in the Canada West and, and how it's affected uh, Canada West. When you take a look at a lot of those old St. Mary's teams and the way that um, Blake Nill uh, and uh, and Larry Utech before him uh, built up that team, key players on those teams. Uh, in the past were, were junior guys from Western Canada and sometimes from Ontario. I, I think in terms of player supply, um, it may have not affected the AUS as much in terms of a competitive level, but the, the five and seven rules also hurt the AUS as well. And uh, they've got to find more inventive ways in terms of, uh, in terms of accessing players and recruiting players and developing players. Well, you see that issue right now with St. Mary's, whose roster is under 70, which is rare. And with all the injuries they've had early on, I believe they're closer down to 60 uh, in terms of players that they have that are on the active roster right now. So they have about 60 players. Now they're trying to change their recruiting philosophy because of the the five, you know, five or seven years to use your five years of eligibility. Well, they they're trying to adjust that now and recruiting more young talent and start developing talent. And St. Mary's hasn't really developed talent over the last few years. They've just taken junior players, plugged them in, and they've had a high turnover rate, but they've been extremely successful in their plan. So that's something that I definitely agree with. With the junior the junior philosophy, teams are going to have to start getting a little more inventive into maxing out their players' eligibility. Well, we know uh, one of the problems at St. Mary's was from the top down, and, and thankfully, uh, uh, if you're in uh, Halifax, uh, Dr. Murphy is back on the scene to uh, kind of help uh, St. Mary's uh, restructure, get back on its feet again as uh, as uh, kind of an interim bridge AD there. Uh, you know, he's obviously very familiar with the program, very familiar with the AUS uh, he was out here at Simon Fraser for a while. Uh, didn't anticipate walking into Simon Fraser and finding out that all of a sudden they wanted to make a jump to the NCAA. I think he, he was surprised as anybody else with that. Uh, but uh, I, you know, if uh, people should have some faith in in in, in the old doctor there, that uh, that he can get things uh, balanced and, and right again with uh, with the Huskies program. Uh, but you know, when you have numbers like that, it's really hard to uh, uh, be competitive, and not not just this year, but in future years, because you just don't have the turnover. Uh, I think UBC, uh, like I talked about before, uh, with their young defense, that's what they ran into with a bit of a short roster out here on the defensive side. And that's why they're getting blown out by Calgary. So, um, uh, to, to to hear about those numbers at St. Mary's, that's a little discouraging. But knowing 
who is uh, leading the program right now, that is encouraging. Yeah, it should be good for St. Mary's in terms of starting to get back on the right uh, right foot and trying to regain that winning tradition. And thank you so much, Jim, for joining us on this air today on Rouge Radio on RougeRadio.com, and uh, we'll be looking forward to talk to you in the future. Okay, thanks very much, Kevin.